He didn't start raising interest rates until he was renominated, just saying. Yes. <laughs> and everyone said he was late. I think he was just waiting for his renomination. Well, it all comes back to our discussion weeks ago. It's like his portfolio is not in good shape. He needs the job. All he had to do was hire <laughs> us and he could do a better job. But, uh, you know, I hope you're listening to us today, Jay. We want to help you. Chris, would you hire Bob as the federal uh, chairman? Of the reserve? I think he would just get reelected based on his hair. I think the issue is, I couldn't speak that solemnly and bo I couldn't be that bored. It, it, it's impossible for me to be a Federal Reserve chairman. <laughs>
I could have some more worse months than September, you know, <laughs> give them to me. Now we're in October, and I don't think things have ever looked better, right? We got earnings estimates, all time record high. You got GDP just estimates just been increased. You got M and A activities going to go through the roof, according to these bankers that Liam's been grooming, you know, for his future <laughs> portfolio. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I mean, it, it looks really good on that on the runway. And yeah. I think that's something people don't necessarily appreciate is we talk about all that cash that people have on hand. And these are like, you know, day to day people, retirees, but it's those institutions like they just can't be happy with current cash rates. They've got investors to call to that that money eventually has to make its way back in. No, it's a great point because private equity, they have to give the money back to you, oh. the investor, get the money put to work. So now the pressure is like they've got to do deals. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's my biggest fear. I talked about this last week on the podcast is is the Fed going to be too aggressive in cutting interest rates? Because let's face it, even though inflation is moderating now, what's it look like a year from now? And I think that's one of the reasons you've seen the 10-year Treasury continue to go up. You know, the Fed's cutting rates, but the 10 years going up because I think we're not pricing in enough inflation. And everything we're talking about is inflationary, right? I mean, you're talking about deficit spending, which is probably not going away. Uh, dollar is weakening. That actually causes inflation. I mean, there's just so many reasons right now You've got to think about inflation when it comes to your portfolio. So, Ryan, you actually aren't a perma bull. <laughs> what do you mean, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to buy equities. That's what you're. That's the best way to hedge inflation. There you go. Okay, just yeah. checking. Yeah, there's inflation on long. There's no inflation on long. Well, you know, Ryan, I secretly think Dad's hoping for some hyperinflation like we had back in the 1980s. He says he misses those 18 percent money market rates. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think the the biggest surprise for me with everything so good. Why did the Fed cut 50 basis points? Why is China throwing a bazooka at their economy? Um, it just seems like it's, we're getting washed in liquidity when we don't really need it. So are they seeing something we don't see? You hear all these strategists talking about this big slowing of the economy we're worried about, when the real risk, in my opinion, is we have a real risk of overheating an already a hot economy. And the data says we're, like you just mentioned it, Bob, economic growth is at 3.1%. That's big economic growth. That's accelerating growth. And everyone's got this opposite view. Like, what land? Am I living in the wrong universe here? Like, what's going on? Yeah. Well, you know, Court, it was, uh, you know, they're always looking for some number, right? Was mm -hmm. what, what, in last month, in the beginning of the month, we had a job, bad jobs number. It was a slightly bad jobs number. <laughs> and, uh, and we had the biggest correction of the year for one week. And then, mm -hmm. like, two weeks later, we're at an all time record high. So there are a lot of people hoping and praying for bad news. Uh, yeah. They don't seem to get it. Yeah. They get a little disappointed. I mean, and also it makes me wonder, was it a political move to cut a half a percentage point? Because really, there's not a lot of softening in the labor market. And again, if these economic numbers keep coming in better and better, like, why is the Fed really cutting rates here? I don't get it, right? Wait a minute. The Federal Reserve chairman is appointed, but that's not a political position. <laughs> that's uh, I, I, I never understood that. He didn't start raising interest rates until he was renominated, just saying. Yes. <laughs> and everyone said he was late. I think he was just waiting for his renomination. Well, it all comes back to our discussion weeks ago. It's like his portfolio is not in good shape. He needs the job. <laughs> All you had to do was hire us, and he could do a better job. But uh, you know, I hope you're listening to us today, Jay. We uh, we want to help you. Chris, would you hire Bob as the federal uh, chairman of the Reserve? I think if anybody saw that head of hair, <laughs> whose hair is better, Courtney, Bob or Jay Powell? I think he would just get reelected based on his hair. I think the issue is, I couldn't speak that solemnly, and bo I couldn't be that boring. <laughs> It's impossible for me to be a Federal Reserve chairman. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sorry. It's just, uh, just not my style. But I think we, we can all agree Bob has better hair than Jay Powell, <laughs> which I think instinctively says you're more trustworthy. This is true. Yes. <laughs> Trust is an urn, right? It's all about the hair. <laughs> One of the first clients I ever brought on to Payne Capital, uh, they actually decided to work with Payne Capital the day we met with Bob, and I have to think that's directly correlated with his hair. <laughs> that's a new chart I'm working on, Chris. <laughs> so, Bob, the big question is, if you were the Fed chairman, what would you do? Would you cut interest rates aggressively? Would you wait? Well, the Fed already did cut interest rates aggressively, right? So if I were the Fed Reserve chairman right now, I would be as long in my portfolio as you can possibly get. If you're not long right now, you're wrong. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, 
Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do, We'll put together a full investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, let's go old school today. This is like actually the first time we've actually had Bob in studio, which is incredible. <laughs> Wearing that hot green shirt if you're actually watching this, not just listening to it. Um, but I thought we could go old school today. What we used to do back on our radio show days is we used to do the spotlight segment where we would actually take a real case, we dissect it, and we talk about how well or how badly somebody's doing on their path to financial independence. And Court, you've been working on a lot of cases lately. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to help you once in a while. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the cases you're working on, and we can talk a little bit about what they're doing right, doing wrong, mm -hmm. just dissect those cases. Now, of these three cases, we have two who are about to retire and one who is already retired, but they're about to become dependent on their portfolio. So they're both at the stage where they're saying, okay, we have this nest egg, how do we draw off of it? Now, two of these cases are very heavily in U.S. stocks, specifically in the S&P 500, and even more specifically in your large cap growth, which is think like your AI companies, like your Apples and Googles and Microsofts. These are very aggressive. Think of you're retired, you're about to draw into your portfolio, but you're invested like a 20-year-old, more than 80% yeah. <laughs> in the stock markets. And then on the flip side, the other case we have is only – less than 10% in stocks and the rest of their money is in cash or very short term certificates of deposit. Yeah. And that's kind of what we see right now is mm -hmm. this like barbell, either, you know, you're all in owning a lot of S and P 500 stocks, mm -hmm. specifically the magnificent seven, which you talk about a lot, or on the other hand, you're just super nervous and you have way too much money in money market funds and cash. Mm -hmm. And like, I would argue both are definitely not the right place to allocate your capital. So Corey, let's talk about the first case where Someone's getting ready to retire. Mm -hmm. um, what was the wake up call when I suddenly they realized the paycheck's not going to come in every two weeks? Yeah. And I think that's pretty often is people want to come to us and say, okay, I'm not going to have a paycheck. Like how can I live off of my portfolio? Which is a good time to look at this, but I would actually argue you want to start to plan for this much earlier <laughs> and the earlier you do this, the better. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good wake up call. Come to us before then. Yeah. Well, I give this woman credit. Uh, she has like a lots of individual stocks. She's like 80% mm -hmm. equity, um, you know, basically retired now, uh, early seventies. And she's starting to realize like, maybe I shouldn't be doing this on my own. Mm -hmm. And we even showed, we went back and back test and said, Hey, your portfolio in a bad market, we went back to 08, 09, you'd be down like 50, 60%. How do you feel about that? And obviously she didn't feel very good about that. <laughs> well, you know, guys, it always comes down to that. There's no institutional memory, right? We had 2000, we had a crash of 50%. And seven years later, you had the 2008 correction of 50%. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, uh, I remember a lot of our prospective clients back then were saying, well, every seven years, the market crashes. Now, market just goes up every quarter. <laughs> so, you know, all of a sudden, people are projecting yeah. the future based on their most recent experience. I give these people a lot of credit for, you know, being nervous about that. Yeah, and you should be nervous about it. I think it's better to be nervous in a bull market than a bear market because we know uh, when prices are high, you're closer to prices going low again, you know? So I'm sure one of the reasons why that she didn't want to take uh, 
money out of the market is because of capital gains tax, right? That's been a huge conversation mm-hmm. that we're trying to yeah. trying to handle. And that's where you kind of need a long-term game plan. Like we can take a certain amount of gains, but it might have to be over a couple of years. We can't just overnight say, yep, take off your risk off the table because it might be a big tax bill. So you need to be very cognizant about that. I think you just show them a chart of my old Merrill Lynch stock that went from 90 to <laughs> 2 uh, when I was contemplating not taking capital <laughs> yeah. gains tax. That's a big wake up call. (laughs) I mean, Courtney is right. I mean, there's definitely a lot of art when it comes to taking capital gains. I mean, a lot of clients don't know that if you take over a certain amount of gains, uh, the federal government charges an extra 3.8% in uh, that net investment tax. Here it is. You're like 15 or 15, 20% capital gains tax, but your portfolio goes down 50 or 60%. You'd be better off taking that 15 to 20% long-term cap gains tax which is like one of the lowest we've ever had in history. Mm-hmm. So I think that is one of the bigger conversations right now. It's like rip the Band-Aid off um, because later on, if you have the real volatility in the market, invariably you always have volatility in the market at some point, you're really going to suffer. So I think it is smart right now. We always say like be proactive when the wind's at your back. That's the time to make good decisions in your portfolio. Don't wait because no one's going to tell you when, okay, we're at the top of the market, the party's over. Mm-hmm. Maybe Bob can. But yeah, I'm not that good yet. I do think we are also approaching the end of the year. And that's where we've been talking a lot of clients. Like, I agree with you. I think ripping the bandaid off makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases. But also when we're so close to the end of the year, phasing this out over just like three months actually is two different years that you're spacing this out. So that's where it can make sense to at least have those conversations. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because, you know, the research we're getting shows that the average household is weighted heavily, more heavily in equities than ever in history. (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, not since the 50s. And it's way up from when it was 2000, 2009, 2008, yeah. 2009. So we have this one client comes in with 80% in equities. And then there's other prospective clients, it's 80% in cash. Yeah. Well, we know there's $6.4 trillion in cash. And then on top of that, you've got another like $2 trillion in CDs or something like that. So, you know, people aren't invested right now. And, you know, this is kind of, we beat the drum up this every week. But your 5%, it's not even 5% anymore. Your money market fund is not like, what, 4.6, 4.7%? Drops a basis point a day. Yeah, as the Fed's cutting, that rate's going to keep coming down. But I think there's this kind of feeling of I'm between a rock and a hard place. You know, my my yield of my money market fund's going down, but I don't want to buy the stock market at an all-time record high. Well, that's the beauty of it. There's so much opportunity other than the MAG7 or the S&P 500. You know, you see the Russell 2000 still below its all-time record highs. Now we have international stocks. By the way, you're saying there's more than seven stocks you can invest? I don't believe that. I'm betting your I watch inheritance. Courtney on, I watched Courtney on CNBC. They only talk about maybe 20 stocks. Betting your entire inheritance, <laughs> Ryan, there being more opportunities than seven companies <laughs> in, in the whole wide world, right? It blows my mind. I mean, last week, guys, 7% move in one week in emerging markets. One week, 28% one week in China. Well, that's the, that's the hard part is that the average person doesn't see the opportunity when it's in front of them. I mean, take China, for example. You know, everybody thinks China's in a recession, but the reality is is that uh, that, that area of the market's starting to move up. Yeah, the thing is, it's like you have to recognize opportunity when it's there, which makes it really hard for investors. Come on, they, they watch the news. They're waiting for the news to get better, waiting for confirmation, right? You take the, uh, you know, the great financial crisis when the market bottomed in 2009. Right. The news was horrible. I mean, we were trying to get people to invest. And they're like, what are you out of your mind, Bob? You were right. Things are really bad. And it was yeah. like six months before the news got better. But you missed a 40 percent move, which is my biggest pet peeve, because people always say to us like, oh, you're so lucky being in the business the last 10 years because the market went straight up. Yeah. But try to get someone invested. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. People were <laughs> shell shocked for years uh, after the big great financial crisis. I mean, Corey, you remember like how hard it would be to convince people just to stay in their portfolio. Any mm-hmm. like sell off, people thought we were going to go off the cliff because that was their most recent experience. So I would say like, that was one of the hardest 10 years to actually have people invested. Um, but now it's the opposite, right? Now you have to like beg people to actually de-risk a little bit, which goes back to that old Warren Buffett quote, right? Like be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. And I think right now more than ever, you got to be really careful how you allocate your capital. And it's happening on both sides. And I think that's where these three cases actually illustrate this well, is people are either really risky and we're trying to get them to take the risk off, or (laughs) 
they're so nervous that we're going to have the, you know, the second shoe to drop or this recession that's coming that you're all in cash right now. Right. And I, I think you need to be somewhere in the middle of those two things in all reality. Um, but they're calling this, you know, those most hated bull market because e as the markets go up, you're seeing more and more money go into cash as people are still getting nervous. So we need to, you know, find a middle ground here. So it's the, you know, the brilliance of the A to B strategy, right? It's so simple. Once you have your end in mind, once you know what your goals are, all you have to do is invest towards those go your goals, not your neighbor's goals, <laughs> you know, not uh, some Yahoo on, on, on CNBC, your goals. It becomes simple. It's like it's a common sense decision as yeah. opposed to an emotional decision. So explain to me, Bob, if I want two yachts by next year, how should I invest my capital today? That's what I want to know. Well, you know, a lot, that's for the next episode, Why, <laughs> Please, you know, I mean, come on. Not all the secrets in one show. Chris told me to put it all in Bob coin, and in a year I'll have two yachts. Is that true, Chris? He just wants to wear that, that captain's correct? hat you gave him, Chris. Remember that captain's hat you bought him? He's been dying to wear it. <laughs> Ryan's always said he's the captain of the ship. I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> but it also brings up another good point. I mean, we, we've had a core position in emerging markets for years, and it's actually you know grossly underperformed what the U.S. market or the S&P 500's done. But what everyone forgets is things change, and it change quickly. And all of a sudden, right, like in one week, you get a 19% return in China, something like that, just like that. Um, and now all of a sudden, you're seeing capital get allocated to different places. And I think that's what's really hard for people to comprehend when they're building their portfolio for retirement is a lot of things are going to work. They're going to work at different times. And you can't have everything into what, whatever's hot right now because that's going to change. And it's going to change before the news gets better. Yeah, I think you're right, Ryan. And I think, you know, the hardest part about having patience, you know, especially when it comes to your money, where, you know, we're all emotional about our own money. You know, I think more so you need somebody to help you see where the opportunity is. You know, someone like us to show you where those opportunities are, you know, especially when things don't seem as bright and cheery as, as the way we see them. Or delusional, Chris. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's why you need to have a portfolio where everything generates income because, it's really not that hard to buy something that's down that's still paid you 4% that goes up every year. And the key is owning the most amount of shares before it goes up. That's the brilliance of wealth creation. It's not about being right every day. It's not about, you know, what's my yield today? What's my yield to noon? You know, it's it's about <laughs> being right over time. So it's, uh, you know, when you, when you only have to add a quarter of 1% to something that's down, it's a lot easier than saying, oh, I got to own this because of X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell Courtney that. She, you know, she has to talk stocks on CNBC. You're ruining her whole rap here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. Bob, I'll give you the first one. Thank you. The market caps of Microsoft, Apple, and NVIDIA make up more than 12% of the MSCI All Countries World Index, a benchmark representing 23 developed markets and 24 emerging markets, and NVIDIA's $3 trillion market capitalization by itself is equal to all 2,000 stocks in the Russell 2000 Small Cap Index combined. Man, oh man, they are big companies. Really big companies, but call me crazy. Uh, buy NVIDIA or buy the Russell 2000, where there's potentially 2,000 new NVIDIAs that nobody's <laughs> ever heard of. Bob, you don't know what you're talking about. All that matters is artificial intelligence and uh, you know, NVIDIA selling more chips in infinity. It's never going to end. Well, next week's podcast, we're going to get a chart of the Russell 2000. We're going to throw darts, and we're going to see who can pick the winners. <laughs> yeah, Bob, what you're saying sounds really risky. <laughs> <laughs> Got that right, Chris. <laughs> All right, Chris. Retail sales in Beijing have been on an upward trajectory, rising by 2.7% in July from a year ago, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. The surprise jump marked the 18th month of expansion in retail trade, that makes me think that maybe this China recovery is actually real. Yeah, you know, it's the world's second largest economy. So, you know, that that's going to be good for us. And uh, to quote Bob, all surprises come in the positive. Well, you know, I feel like a lot of these strategists, they just don't believe it. They're just like, this is a little bit of stimulus on, on they're just putting more money at a problem that's not going to go away. But you're right. Like, how can the second largest economy in the world at some point not come out of this crisis just like we did back in 08 and 09 when it came to real estate? Yeah, it comes down to analysts are lazy, right? So it's <laughs> so easy for the last 10, 15 years to just pick the S&P 500. Who needs China? Yeah. <laughs> I think things are changing. We'll see. All right, Courtney, 
machinist rejected Boeing's proposal for a 30% pay increase as a blatant show of disrespect. Can anyone say labor shortage? <laughs> yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, clearly these machinists have the power here. Boeing has a lot of issues at the moment, so clearly they have the pay raises. It's interesting this is also coming as there's a port strike right now, and you may see increases kind of across the board when it comes to labor. Mm -hmm. So I think the question begs is, is there still inflation that could come from some of these labor shortages? Yeah, I mean, inflation and also everyone's talking about the labor market fall off a cliff. You know, you don't strike and ask for better benefits uh, if you think that there's not a lot of jobs available. So good point. I'm calling BS on the fact that uh, everyone thinks the labor market's softening. I don't know. Courtney, Chris, and I will not reject a 30% increase from you, Ry. <laughs> so we're gonna we're not gonna disrespect you. We're we're all we're all in. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm gonna get in a uh, aluminum tube that flies at 30,000 feet and 600 miles an hour, I want to make sure those machinists are well compensated. <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a really and good point. With regards to the 30% raises, take care and brush your hair. <laughs> hey, hope you enjoyed episode 177, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, you love our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. If this is Spotify, you can do the same thing. You can subscribe to our channel. If this is YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. All your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 